Hi everyone, um, thank you for joining us and I'll just wait a minute or so or 30 seconds or so just to make sure everyone gets into the room. So brilliant, thank you very much for joining us again um, for another one of these lectures. Um, obviously we've had some brilliant ones last week and uh, we had a great one on architecture and the built environment yesterday that was really fantastic. I imagine some of you were probably at that one as well. Um, today, is the focus is more on design engineering, product engineering. And again, very lucky to have some fantastic guests with us. So we have Christopher Lim, who is from Dundee University, um, who um, is an admissions tutor there for the product design program. And we also have Joseph Flynn uh, from the University of Bath. And he runs a very similar design engineering program, although both of them will go into a bit more detail about exactly what the, the, their courses consist of and how they mix into other areas. So um, without further ado, I'm, I'm going to hand over now to um, Christopher and he's going to start his um, talk about um, Dundee and, and the programme there. So thank you very much. Thank you. So let me get my screen up. Um, if somebody could let me know how that is. Going. I can set, yeah, we can see your screen. That's no problem. So you oh. present away. Fantastic. Right. Thank you very much, Joe. Um, very good evening to all of you. Thank you for spending time with us uh, this evening. Um, what I'm going to do for my talk is I'm going to talk about the role of technology in design. And it's coming from a product design Dundee perspective. So a bit about my background, I was trained as a product design engineer uh, in Glasgow and worked in the maritime engineering industry before deciding to do a, a PhD uh, that basically gets a doctor um, in front of my name, um, but I'm not a medical doctor um, um, for, for those of you who, who, who wants to know more about it. Um, but my, my area of PhD uh, or research is really about exploring the area of design for inclusion. Uh, specifically investigating people's mental models and their interaction with the interface of uh, digital as well as electromechanical products. Um, after my PhD, I, 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 I worked for a design consultancy in Glasgow uh, as a researcher and designer uh, before being employed uh, over at the University of Surrey, uh, Digital's Digital World Research Centre, to research and co-design digital products for older people. So my work has, as you can see, involved technology in its broader sense, one way or another. So the creative economy in the UK is, is, is generally more agile and adaptive and faster to respond um, to, uh, to changes in, in the economy, the world economy. And many of our graduates are now working not only in product uh, design and engineering sectors, but also the marketing and, and brand management agencies within the creative uh, industries. So within the creative economy, the UK technology sector grows 2.6 times faster than the overall economy. And, um, and according to um, the report, uh, it, um, the Tech Nation report, it says that the UK is ranked third in the world for total capital invested in digital tech companies behind the US and China. And the overall turnover is said to be about um, uh, worth 184 billion uh, pounds uh, to the economy. So it's worth a lot. Um, and in the Malaysian manufacturing sector, 38% of the contribution um, comes from electrical and electronic sector. And the Malaysian government in 2017, I believe, um, launched the National Transformation 200, 2050 Agenda, uh, which aims to position Malaysia as one of the top 20 nations in economic development, um, uh, social advancement and innovation by 2050. And the agenda outlines five focus areas, which includes uh, information, communication, technology, and that's involved things like Internet of Things. So, Within the creative uh, economy, um, digital technology is really here to stay. So in Dundee, um, this, these are the four kind of values that we have, people, design, technology, and place. 
Um, and place is not really what you usually hear because um, uh, place um, is where our environment um, affects how we interact with uh, objects and products as well. So product design in Dundee involves conceiving objects that creates new experiences for people. Here in Dundee, the work our students produce are often digital and interactive. Uh, we believe the roles uh, or we believe that the roles technology play in people's life is more important than the technology itself. Uh, we learn from people and design together with them in response to their everyday life. Place is a developing ethos for us. So what does place mean for a physical object and product design? How can the physical, environmental and social characteristics of a place influence the design and the use of a product and vice versa? So, and design for us is both process and practice. We craft objects and sometimes apps that people would use and enjoy using, shaping, refining, detailing, not just the aesthetics, but interactions, behaviors, and information. Embodying our objects and apps are technology. Technology for us is not just being digital. It means prototyping iteratively using technology, which could range from materials to code, to tests, play um, and share ideas with other people. We make working prototypes, creating new experiences and interactions for and with people. So very, very much um, of what we do here in Dundee is making things visual and design is essentially thinking made visual. Um, so it's not just words, right? What we do is we sketch, um, we make things, uh, we make models and we prototype, right? And we bring our ideas to life. And along the way, we have to take into a lot of other considerations or factors as well um, in the design process. And these are some of the, of the lists of things that designers um, have to take into account of. And often it is a very messy process. There's a lot of toing and froing. It's not a linear process. So if you're making functional objects, you have to build functional objects to think. And one of our ethos is really encouraging our students to test ideas, to test hypotheses. And a lot of it is very much embedded in a studio culture. So in all four years of studying here in Dundee, uh, in product design, uh, you, we have a studio culture. So it's a really much a bit like what you would get outside in uh, industry, uh, where you work together with other people within a space. In level one, um, students from product design uh, shares their space with uh, interaction design, as well as uh, interior and environmental design courses. So you would have, um, you'll be learning uh, subjects from those other areas as well. And this create a very, very rich environment where um, we learn about how other designers think and, you know, um, and other subject matters that product design might not necessarily uh, touch on. In level two, uh, this is where students uh, from product design get more in depth into um, their skills and knowledge of making. So we send our students over to the School of Engineering where they are taught um, uh, things like uh, electricity and electronics. Um, our students study you know, um, structures and materials and manufacturing. We also um, collaborate with the School of uh, com Computing where our students learn uh, coding. So um, how do you uh, uh, make things move through Arduino, which is a, a, like a, 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 a chip that allows you to take information or data from sensors and create an output, which makes things move, for example. And these are some projects that our students embarked on. So this is a radio project where our students learn to integrate um, uh, electronics into uh, their final uh, envisionment of what uh, a speaker would look like. And this student uh, has chosen the theme of uh, a speaker uh, on uh, a beachfront or a beach. 
uh, a lot of times we get our students to 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 prototype so we we, we do what we call low fi or low fidelity prototyping which we use things like cardboard and paper to try to um, uh, test our ideas and one and once you know we we know that th this is the direction that we want to go and you know our users uh, know what they want uh, we then proceed into more what we call high fidelity prototyping where we start to integrate um, um, things like uh, electronics and, and materiality into the final product so the project on the uh, or this project is really looking at uh, connected products for reading stories to children who are uh, hearing impaired or deaf. In level three, um, this is a project that is um, what the students call it the, the social meter. Um, it is a device designed to measure the amount of time people spend on their phones in a traditional Scottish pub. And, um, and it won an award in the Sunjun Design um, Contest. Uh, for young talents at the uh, UNESCO competition. So, um, so we, we, we design objects with, um, with society in mind, and sometimes it involves um, um, being critical, critical, critical about how people use technology in our everyday life. Um, this is another project that our students uh, get to work uh, with uh, a company called Instrument based in Glasgow, um, where they designed uh, bespoke a, a stationery uh, and, and watches. And here uh, we have Kevin Sinclair who designed uh, a, a min very minimistic uh, kind of uh, uh, lamp for the company. Um, and these are some of the uh, things that he explored from the interaction of how uh, this lamp could be uh, switched on and off to uh, the components that's within the desk line. In level four, so just to let you know that in Scotland, we uh, students have uh, undergraduate students study for four years rather than three years, uh, uh, which uh, what, that's what uh, you would do if you study in an English universities. Uh, so in Scotland, uh, in year four, which is your final year, students get to choose their own project. Um, so here we have Peter Iverson, who spent his third year in Kenya, and he was inspired to do something to help children there to study during the night, as they suffer a lot of power shortages and have to resort to kerosene lamp, which is dangerous and, and unhealthy. Um, so Study Bright is his project, which is an alternative way of um, a low cost uh, solution to allow students to study in total darkness. And he, he uses what, um, um, it's called a, a ranking engine, basically. And what uh, you do is you put a, a tea light underneath uh, a, a can. And what, it, what happens is there's water in the can and it, um, and it, it, it moves the, um, the, the flywheel, which you can see here. Uh, and that generates the electricity to light up the LED. Um, so it's basically converting heat into kinetic energy and then using it and converting it into electrical energy. Um, so these are the prototypes that he did um, um, to get to his final working uh, result, uh, which is a fantastic, uh, uh, it's a fantastic project. Um, sometimes our students uh, look at materials. So here um, we have Michael, who was really interested in uh, seaweed or kelp as an alternative material to leather. So he was out in the Scottish coastal areas gathering uh, seaweed and doing experiments with them and, um, and creating this uh, kelp bag um, that is sustainable. And um, you know, people who, uh, are, who are vegan uh, might want to buy one of these bags. And we have students also who, um, might be interested in, in, in the area of design for inclusion. And here, uh, this student was looking at how can you design uh, more accessible um, cutleries and, and plates for helping people with uh, Parkinson uh, disease to have their meals properly uh, and with dignity. Um, Amy Lowe here, um, who's 
fourth year project uh, is, is an interactive storyboard called Hello Hospital, which helps um, children and parents learn about each stage of a hospital visit prior to admission. Um, she is now uh, working as a user researcher and designer with PBR. So in the next couple of slides, I'm going to show where our students um, have gone on to after they graduate uh, from the course. Here, Alif, um, whose project was a device that protects uh, diabetic uh, children from the dangers of nocturnal hypos uh, by you know, monitoring their blood sugar level, is now with uh, uh, Filament PD, a design consultancy in Glasgow. Matt Healy, uh, who designs a, a collection of objects to help someone monitor uh, uh, their heart condition, is now a lead designer at SANA, um, who has got an office in San Francisco, making uh, smart sleep masks for people. And in order to create these objects, we have wonderful facilities within uh, Duncan of Jordanston College of Art and Design, or DJ Cat for short. Uh, and this is a few slides that show uh, the design process that uh, Matt went through. Um, and in order to make this happen, uh, we have foundries within the art school okay, um, that helps you to physicalize your ideas, like to make objects or products. Um, we have um, uh, we have textiles uh, department, uh, looms that allow you to, to make textiles. Right? We have a, a maker space. This is screen printing, by the way, but we do have a, a maker space that allows you to do things like 3D printing, etc. And these are some of the uh, places that our students uh, have gone on, uh, companies that have gone to work with. So um, the rise of making or, or crafting and the wide availability of making processes and tools have reshaped what the creative economy looks like right? and how we approach uh, education uh, in design. And, and also consumers are valuing things that are well considered and, and built to last. Um, and this is something increasingly um, really, really um, what we can see uh, our students are really passionate about looking at things that are sustainable um, and how to make things uh, last longer. And also we are living in a complex world, you know, things like climate change, sustainability, sustainability that I mentioned earlier, aging population, um, healthcare challenges, and, and these um, um, issues are uh, a fertile ground for designers and engineers alike uh, to, to, to make a, an appropriate response um, to the challenges that we live in. And in order to create meaningful things for society, we have to engage people in the design process and incorporate technology only if it's appropriate and necessary. So here in DJCAT, um, uh, we are one of the top uh, design school in Scotland, as well as in, in the UK. And um, so these are some statistics um, uh, just to show um, where we are at uh, in the context of art and design in the UK. So why not product design here in Dundee? And thank you very much for listening in. Thank you. That's fantastic, um, Chris. Really, really interesting stuff there. And I, as always, I'm I particularly like seeing all the prototypes. I quite think I've quite liked to buy some of the pre-design uh, products. I quite like the ones that were made out of paper and car. That I thought they were fantastic. <laughs> um, okay, I, I warned you both earlier. There might not be many questions because just there an architect, we didn't have many. Well, I was wrong. Got lots of questions in the chat for you fantastic. later on. So don't worry about that. They're all lined up, ready to go. And if if anyone has any more questions, please do add them. And I'll ask them at the end after after we've done our next talk. So we're, we've got, we're moving from Scotland now down to England. So we've got um, uh, Joe here, Joe Flynn um, from Bath, uh, their design engineering program. So Joe, would you like to tell us a bit about that and 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 where you're coming from at Bath Academic? 
Yeah, it'd be my pleasure. Thank you, Joe. Uh, hopefully, I'm coming through clearly uh, with the audio, and I also Absolutely. hope you can, can see hear my... you and see your screen, Joe. No problem. Fantastic. Well, thank you so much for joining uh, me today, everyone. Um, I'm here today to talk to you about a very specific degree that we're now offering at the University of Bath. Um, we've been offering it for three years, and it's called Integrated Design Engineering, and this belongs within the Department of Mechanical Engineering at the University. So before I launch into talking about the programme itself, I'll just give a brief introduce, introduction to the University of Bath as an institution. So Bath is uh, very fortunate in that it's situated within a UNESCO World Heritage City. So it's a, a very historic city in the southwest of England, and it's sort of famous for its um, Roman population uh, a couple of thousand years ago and also famous for its Georgian architecture, some examples of which you can see in the background of this image of some of our students. And this is a view of the city from a nearby hillside looking down into the heart of the city. And it's well connected as a city. It's about 80 minutes from London and only about 12 minutes from another fantastic city called Bristol. So if you wanted to travel internationally or come from overseas, it would be about two hours from London Heathrow Airport and only 45 minutes from Bristol International Airport. Now, just outside of the city centre is the university itself. So it's about one mile outside the city centre. And this is the heart of our campus up on the hill uh, just outside the city. And what we have here is an overview of uh, some of our laboratory and teaching space. You can also see some of our sports facilities and much of the first year accommodation uh, for students is also situated on campus right next to where you do your learning so quite convenient for our undergraduates so if you wanted to study mechanical engineering at the university of bath uh, there's lots of ways you can do it there's lots of ways you can apply and depending on which sort of qualification structure you've come from the offers can be a bit different but typically we would expect people to have an a star and two a's including maths and physics with the A star in either maths or physics. There are alternative offers that are made on the basis of undertaking something like an EPQ or a further maths A level. So there can be some flexibility there. But the most important take home message from this is that depending on which qualification stream you're coming from, the best source of information for what the entry requirements are is the university website. So if you're interested, I'd encourage all of you to check out the university website in your own time. So integrated design engineering, what, what is it? It's perhaps not immediately obvious from the title, but basically it is the integration of design, electronic and software elements within one degree program. And I think perhaps the best person to describe this is my dear friend and colleague, Dr. Elise de Koning. It's a uh, it's her concept. She brought this course to life three years ago now, and she's given a fantastic overview in this video. So I'll share this with you now. Uh, I do hope the sound will come through. So please tell me if it doesn't come through. The Integrated Design Engineering course is a course where students learn to integrate mechanical, electronic and software skills in design projects. Students will benefit from learning the latest design methods as well as the latest manufacturing techniques. These will come together and enable students to design products that can be manufactured in industry. Design is really important at Bath. It's the glue that joins together our technical subjects in a practical way. In the first year, the students are taught engineering drawing and in the subsequent years, they'll carry out individual and group projects to solve problems for industry. The course shares the first two years in the mechanical and electronic departments. Those are the two years where we teach the engineering foundations, the engineering science, and combine that with an introduction to design. Students will then go off on placement and coming back from that experience, they will be together in the integrated design engineering course, working in a studio environment on real design make and test projects. 
At Bath, I've really enjoyed the design making test projects we've been able to do, both individually and in group work as well. It's been a great opportunity to explore your engineering interests and really develop something that you can be proud of. It's real life experience, it's not all theoretical here. I got out, got to make something, I got to go out and speak to people, did a little bit of marketing, looked at the sort of business side to it. Design project programme is really tailored to your individual needs. You're guided through your learning through the process, but you're also allowed to explore areas that you're more interested in, propose projects that you want to do. Graduates from Integrated Design Engineering course will be taking creative product development roles. Those could be in design consultancies, engineering consultancies or specialist in-house design teams. At Bath, we also support our graduates who have product ideas that they want to turn into businesses. My degree programme at Bath has provided a great opportunity to get stuck into product development and has put me in a great position to dive straight into a commercial consultancy environment. Okay, so a lovely summary of the course there. Um, but what were the drivers? Why did we create this new degree program? Well, really it was in response to two communities. The first community were the students themselves. So there was a lot of feedback from the students that suggested they wanted to do more design project work to get hands-on more with their degree. And also there was increasing pressure from economic drivers such as the need for people to be able to practically develop products that are innovative, creative, and that encompass all of the elements of what many products now have, which is an aspect of electronics, an aspect of mechanical elements, and also a software feature. In addition to this, we're really trying to promote engineers showcasing their innovation and entrepreneurship skills. And that's something that we try to foster within the IDE program. And actually, we've had quite a lot of success with students going on to start their own businesses as a result of this program. So I'll just give a little bit about the structure now so that you know what to expect from a program like this. So in general, when you come to Bath, you're undertaking a four year accredited MEng qualification. So that's four years of study. And I've outlined those there on the right hand side. And in between years two and three of your study, there's an optional placement, which is a paid placement within industry. And just to give you an idea, about 70 to 75% of our students do go on one of these placements. It's a fantastic enriching opportunity where you can develop your professional skills and see what engineering is like out in industry. Now, once you return from your placement, or if you, if you don't go on a placement and you continue straight from year two, that's when we start to customize the degree program to suit the IDE uh, core principles. And so from year three onwards, you would be experiencing specific units that are tailored towards uh, electronics, software, mechatronics, business, and many more. And then in the second semester of year three, you would undertake what's called the group design and business project. Now, this is a semester long project that's usually supported by industry. So an industrial partner will come in and propose an engineering problem. And a group of about six students or so will have to not only come up with a technical solution to this problem, but also come up with the business model to go alongside it. In the fourth year, you have much more choice over the units you're taking. In fact, you, you hand pick the units that interest you from a very wide pool. And you generally complete those in semester one. And semester two is spent doing what's called the major individual design project. So again, this is a semester long project, but this time working as an individual, usually specifically within the remit of design or product design. And you work one on one with an academic such as myself, and you'll meet regularly, usually once or twice a week, as you develop a brand new idea over the course of that semester. Now, I talked about those, uh, like the different approach that IDE takes. And in particular, that revolves around studio-based learning. So quite similar to, to Dundee in that respect. So there's a view on the left-hand side here of one of the classrooms or studios. 
and it's actually being viewed through the workshop that is directly attached to that class classroom so your learning and your making are only a number of steps apart okay so you just have to walk through one door to bring your ideas to life through the making aspect of the process and some of these labs are more mechanical or manufacturing orientated and on the right you can see uh, the same thing but for an electronics and software setting and the equipment changes depending on the sort of unit that you're taking. So to give you an idea of some of the bespoke courses that you can only take if you're on this degree program, uh, the first of which is called user centered design. Now this is design, but putting the end user at the heart of the story. So in this course, what we do is work with a charity called Designability, and the students work uh, face to face and very hands on with uh, real people that are living with disability. And what they do is try to design innovative products that would improve the quality of life and maintain the dignity of these individuals. And so the example that's given on this screen here is um, a reimagined ATM machine for withdrawing cash from the bank, because actually you wouldn't believe how many people with disabilities struggle to use this technology. And so this concept and these prototypes would have been created from the ground up working one-on-one -on -one with a real member of the public. We also have uh, two mechatronics units and in mechatronics one, this is the first uh, example of when students are interfacing mechanical, electronic control and software engineering elements. And the challenge in this unit is to create a machine that can automatically detect buried treasure. So there's a big, a big sand pit with various targets buried beneath the sand. You can't actually see them. And they need to prototype, manufacture, test, and then compete with a machine that will go and recover all of that buried treasure. So the sensing and the searching is all automated and there's software that's written to do that. And then the actual mechanical elements of the rig that do the, the searching and recovery also have to be designed and prototyped too. Now, a big part of design is actually taking inspiration from what already exists. And we have a dedicated unit called reverse engineering and in brackets I've put for disruptive innovation. And the whole purpose of this unit is to do what we call a deep dive into how an existing product works. So we have industrial sponsors that supply, uh, in this case, domestic goods for the household. And the students in small teams have to completely dismantle these objects and really analyze them to get to grips with what the core working principles are. Now, once they've done this, they can identify areas of weakness or perhaps opportunities for improvement and then suggest modifications that would make for a disruptive or competing product, depending on who was going to take it on. So this is a really important part of the product study ethos that we have within the IDE program and getting to grips with exactly how things work and identifying intelligent ways to improve them is a really useful activity. Now, this is uh, close to my heart because this is actually my unit within the program and I teach design optimization. And design optimization really is not about just coming up with a solution, but coming up with a very, very good solution within certain constraints. And so what students do on this unit is they use physics-based modeling to optimize the shape of wind turbine blades. So this involves lots of computer programming and a sort of trip down memory lane to some of the mathematics and physics that they've established in years one, two, and three. And then what they do is they produce these blades either by fabrication using techniques like laser cutting or possibly even 3D printing. So the ones in the video on the right-hand side are 3D printed blades, and then they are tested to compare the actual performance against the planned performance in the University of Bath wind tunnel. So very much a hands-on engineering experience for the students there. So if you join the IDE program, well, what sort of community are you gonna be a part of? Well, the answer is we tend to keep our class sizes relatively small, so between 20 and 30 students. And these students become a, a sort of family, if you will, they become a very close-knit community who all share in their design experience. 
Often they'll be undertaking team-based learning tasks, working closely to overcome a particular engineering challenge. And they also come from all sorts of different backgrounds. So the IDE program will take people from mechanical, electrical, and also our integrated mechanical and electrical degree programs. So we have a really mixed cohort with lots of different talents, and that tends to make things much more exciting and fun. When you've uh, completed your IDE program, the, the number of jobs that are available uh, to you is, is, it was actually surprising to us. You know, we had a, a view that people would be going into larger engineering firms and their R&D departments or product design consultancies. But actually what we've seen in recent years is it's much, much broader than that. So I've listed just a small sample on the right-hand side. So we, yes, we do have product designers, but we also have patent engineers one of our students went on to become a pilot. Uh, some have gone into the software and gaming sector, which is really exciting. Um, people working within governmental roles, and then also sort of process scientists uh, within production facilities and things like that. Also, some people use it as a springboard to go on and do further study, such as uh, a postgraduate master's or indeed a, a PhD. So there's a whole raft of, uh, of future opportunities for our students. Um, I, I haven't named uh, companies quite intentionally, but if you'd like to understand a bit more about the sorts of companies we send our students to, then I'm very happy to answer that as a, as a question outside of the, the session. It'd be my pleasure to, to talk you through that. And so that really brings me to the end of my talk. Um, on this slide, I've left a barcode, which you're very welcome to, to use. And this will take you to a form where you can ask for more specific information from our admissions team. I'd also like to point you to our um, IDE website because you have loads of useful information there about the program specifics. And if you'd like to get in touch with me directly, you are more than welcome to do so. And my email is there. So I'm going to stop there and uh, hand back to Joe. Thank you. That's brilliant, Joe. Thank you. Brilliant. Fascinating again. And obviously, again, just seeing all the interesting things that you're doing there is just absolutely amazing. Some of the things you're coming up with there. Is working on really is fascinating i'm sure that anyone sort of looking at the moment will be just uh, dying to get on and work in some of these labs and do some of this production it really does look amazing um to start a bit of a q a now now and i can see that um chris from dundee has been very busy in the chat anyway answering some of these questions but i thought i'd ask them out open wide anyway so that everyone can hear them as we go through but perhaps chris will start with you on, on this one um I know you've kind of covered it. I think you've both sort of been quite clear, really. These are quite interdisciplinary courses that take on a number of different skills and areas. Um, but, but what do you see this? Is this more for a designer or an engineer? I mean, what is the what is the what are the sort of core skills that you're looking for on these courses? Is this one for director? For you first, I think we'll go for you. First. <laughs> okay, so, Just to give Joe, Joe's I, been talking, so we'll swap over. No, no worries, no worries. <laughs> I'll give him a break. So you're talking about core skills that you would get after you've gone through the course? Well, I guess what you're looking for coming on, yeah, and sure, what, what, what you're likely to produce. Are you producing more designers or, I guess, kind of more engineers in the more traditional understanding of that word? Yeah, I think, I think when, uh, for students... In the past, we have students who have gone on to sort of engineering jobs like Dyson uh, um, and, and to NCR. But um, lately, we have students also moving on to design consultancy and, and, and a more user research kind of um, uh, sectors. So um, for, our, for, for Dundee, I wouldn't say ours is um, an engineering course. I would say it's a design course. Uh, we, uh, we do have uh, engineering subjects um, taught to students, but our students uh, um, come out as designers, not as engineers. Um, so, yeah, I hope that answers the question. <laughs> I think it does. And, and, and Joe, just the same for you, really. I mean, what, what, what do you, yeah, yeah, but who are you looking? I know you've sort of mentioned at the end there, but who are you looking for, and and and, and what do you kind of produce in terms of the students? Right, so all of our students on this programme are by definition engineers, but the purpose of the programme is to try and get more traditional engineers to think like product designers and behave like product designers. So in a sense, we're bridging, trying to bridge the gap between those two disciplines. Um, but no, there's no, no mistake, all of our students are engineers by qualification and, and by their, their education as well. 
Fantastic. A really good question I thought come up. What I'm quite interested to know a bit more about, it. I guess most of the examples you gave of the work that you were producing, again, particularly kind of household items, quite small scale products, is that, does that tend to be the focus or, you know, are, are there kind of much larger projects as well? I mean, uh, the, the, the students might be involved in what, what, in terms of that, is that quite accurate to say we're looking at more kind of smaller consumer products as the basis for what you're looking at? Either of you. Either of you. Um, <laughs> <laughs> well, um, I, I would speak for Joe because um, I, have, I, have no, I have no idea what, what his um, cost entails, but, um, but traditionally, I would say uh, for engineering, um, I was trained as an engineer, uh, and it really depends on your sort of um, uh, assignments, I guess. Um, so for Dundee, uh, we expect our students to make working prototypes. So in a way, uh, that kind of helps if, 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 if the project is on a, 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 a smallish scale. But I would say that if it's a big scale uh, project, we will ask our students to, to model, you know, what, what will be the expected outcome. For us, it's really about the experience. Um, so if you can't do it functionally, uh, because it's a huge uh, 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 product or object, then uh, we would like you to show us um, how you mod it to maybe approximate the experience uh, that someone uh, would have using uh, the, the big product. Um, yeah. <laughs> okay, fantastic. And, and, and Joe, what would any, anything sort of add further? Well, I think, I think it's a really astute observation. It's a great question. But what, what I would say in response is that it's not so much the physical scale that's the, the defining factor. It's more to do with the degree of complexity within the item itself or the system itself. And so there is a, a sort of reasonable limit to what one individual is able to achieve within a single semester. And that will sort of dictate the level of complexity in whatever they're designing is. So what we see more often is people doing a deep dive into a system that's, you know, perhaps not as complex as an entire aircraft or ship. Um, and if it was going to be something more complex, then that would fall under one of the group uh, design activities. So in particular, in year three, we have lots of people designing things on the level of complexity equivalent to an electric vehicle or an aircraft or an entire manufacturing production system. But really, that's something that you need a lot of um, people power to pull off. And so we save that for the group activities. Okay, excellent. I think that's really interesting. Obviously, you can see I think from that, obviously, you know, you can you can match those things up. The skills you learn on one will obviously be able to correspond on to, to, to a much larger scale later on. Obviously, it's quite difficult to necessarily do that always at a university. Um, I've got some more kind of uh, specific points, really, I guess, in terms of the type of engineering that you do and how specialised you go. So people have asked about things like working with timbers, textiles, and, and I know, Chris, you answered the question about biomedical engineering as well. Um, Chris, so in terms of the, those first two I mentioned and, and other things like that, can, can you sort of specialise into those specific areas or is it more you're just using really any materials really all the time? And, and I know you gave an answer to biomedical engineering as well. So perhaps you'd just like to tell us about that yeah. as well. I think um, we, we don't really specify a material. Our students are taught like, you know, um, in, in their mat, uh, materials uh, uh, subject, um, in things like composites, uh, wood, uh, plastics, um, uh, um, you know, these are sort of materials, uh, um, things like textiles. Um, we, we, we have a, um, a textile department here. So we encourage our students to really explore other materials, things like textiles. We have a ceramic studio as well. So things like clay and ceramics, uh, um, metal workshop. So it's a very hands-on experience. So we, although we do students do learn the, the theoretical side of things, um, we really much like them to handle the materials themselves um, and, and see how they would behave. Uh, and, and what is uh, the best uh, material to use for your prototypes. 
obviously, you know, there are products uh, or final products that would, you know, you, you will not get the, the, the material, uh, the right material um, uh, because it's either too expensive or the process is, is you know, you can't do it in, at the university level. Um, but there, there has to be consideration into, you know, what the final materials is going to be, uh, but also during a prototyping, what will be uh, appropriate, you know, uh, to make the, pro the product to look like and feel like uh, uh, the, the final uh, envisionment of it. Um, the question around uh, prosthetics and medical devices, I would say if you are really, really interested in, um, in, in, in how it, things work and, and uh, in a much deeper level, um, then engineering, design engineering would be a much uh, appropriate course for you because you really go into engineering subjects like you know, fluid mechanics, you know, finite element analysis, and things like that, which um, uh, in Dundee, uh, those subjects will not be covered. Um, so, so um, yeah. yeah. So, so perhaps a more specialized program in that if you're looking at it at all. Uh, uh, Joe, do you have anything to add on just, on just those two? Uh, yeah, so on the one hand, I completely agree with uh, what Chris said in that the material selection is usually um, it usually arises through the design process. It's not something that you have in mind from the get-go, and it's about choosing a functional material for any given application. Um, and so you tend to leave that as an open question, pending, testing, prototyping, and things like that. And there are no there are no strict limits on the materials you would be allowed to handle unless they were specifically very dangerous materials. Uh, at the university. But um, as for things like uh, biomedical, so we're a very large proportion of the projects that are done as individuals in the fourth years tie into the, the medical field. So we have a, a, a research group and a teaching area called biomedical engineering at Bath. And I would say perhaps as many as 25, 30% of the projects end up being within a medical discipline for prostheses um, and other kind of augmentations of, of people to help improve the quality of their life. So there's a lot of things for people who've had a hip replacement. There's things for uh, athletes working with disabilities as all kinds of kind of uh, recovery enablers from surgery, uh, as well as um, you know, right the way through to robotic hands. So one of the projects last year was a robotic hand. Excellent. Um I've got just speaking on the kind of technical side of things. Actually, we we're quite lucky at the school. We're very, very well um, well resourced school, so we have a lot of um, things like three D printers, lots of good CAD products, and and, um, and opportunities to use that. And we've had a question about that, about what kinds of CAD programs you do. So perhaps more on the kind of software side of things. Um, I guess with perhaps a view from some of these students, with kind of get making sure they're they're learning some of these skills early, perhaps. So what, what kinds of software are you using? Uh, Chris, should we go to you? Yeah, software for design, uh, you mean things like CAD, basically, yeah? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So uh, we use SOLIDWORKS, so um, our students are taught SOLIDWORKS here. But um, over the years, we realized that a lot of, um, well, not a lot, but students who take the design and technology route in, in high school, they would come in with, uh, uh, skills, you know, so some depending on what uh, skills the, the schools teach them, it could be Autodesk, it could be SketchUp. So, um, so I, I would say, you know, um, whether you go to Bath or, or, or Dundee or any schools uh, that teaches design um, or engineering, um, don't worry because those skills that you have learned in high school are transferable. Um, and even if you don't have those skills, they will be taught uh, in, 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 in the department. So, um, um, you know, you, 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 will, you will have the opportunity to, to learn those skills. We are not expecting every student coming in uh, to, to know how to do CAD. <laughs> um, so, and, and even if you are, say, you know, you, 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 you use SOLIDWORKS or, or, you know, again, there's a lot of other packages, you know, like Rhino 3D, uh, Fusion 360, and again, those those skills that you you learn for a particular package are transferable uh, to other packages as well. Okay, fantastic. Uh, Joe, Joe, anything to add on that one? Uh, 
Uh, yeah, so we use Autodesk products at the University of Bath. Um, so if you were designing something that was a very complicated assembly on the level of complexity of a car or something like that, um, we would use Autodesk Inventor. But increasingly, we're recognizing that not all CAD related tasks need that level of complexity. And so we also support Autodesk Fusion 360, which you can access for free as a, as a student. And so anybody who'd want to sort of experience that before they go to university, I'd recommend, uh, you know, having a go at developing your skills with Fusion by downloading a, a free license and using their tutorials. Their tutorials are really, really good. Fantastic. Uh, just, just quickly on some of the kind of academic side of things, uh, do, do either of you ask for portfolios for your particular courses? Is that something that's required for entry? Um, Chris, first of all, perhaps do you have a kind of portfolio or interview uh, component that? Yeah, we require a portfolio. Um, uh, and, um, and usually, uh, well, I don't know. Well, this last, the last two years have been pretty strange. We usually, we usually, I think for if you are based in England, uh, um, you, you, you'll be given the opportunity to come up for an interview as well. Uh, um, uh, but, you know, but if you're, if you're a local student, if you're Scot Scottish based, uh, we usually um, ask students to, to come to us uh, for an interview and to, to showcase the portfolio. Um, the reason why we do that is so that, um, you know, students get to look at the surroundings, talk to uh, uh, students from other levels as well. Um, and what, what we really want is to make sure that the students are comfortable uh, uh, you know, by seeing the environment and, and by looking at uh, you know, the things that we do. Um, so it's really about the, the student themselves, you know, um, whether they, you know, is this the right place for them? And in these COVID and uh Bearing in mind, we're on the other side of the world. Uh, yes. More <laughs> online. Uh, yeah, so they'll be, uh, they'll, they'll be on, online uh, uh, mostly. Yeah. So, um, yeah. so, so your portfolio is sort of the, the, uh, the gateway in terms of. Yeah. yeah. Okay, yeah. so you do have that. And I guess what people ask then is if you're looking for anything in particular in this portfolio, is there anything particular that you're yeah. hoping to find within it? Mm -hmm. uh, in your for portfolio preparation, um, it's. I think some students or applicants think that uh, we like to see finished products. In fact, uh, we don't. <laughs> we very much like to see your process, um, your thinking. So by all means, create, you know, put in some images of, of finished articles or finished products, but do put in things like, you know, your sketches, you know, where you, got your, where you get your inspiration from, uh, annotate, you know, your sketches, you know, how, you know, what, what's the decision making or thinking behind, uh, behind uh, your, your work. Um, so we, we really, really welcome uh, also things that you do outside um, your curricula. So if you're interested in photography, you know, uh, please have some of those images up as well. Yeah. Fantastic. Joe, yourself, portfolio so sort of thing? We, we don't take portfolios. Uh, it's the more traditional UCAS application with a personal statement and um, predicted grades and things like that. And we also don't interview within the department um, with the small exception of a few cases that are coming in with, um, without uh, A-level qualifications. So uh, we, we call that the widening participation stream. Um, so for the vast majority of people, it will be standard UCAS application um, with personal statement, predicted grades, et cetera. So I, I guess, again, I mean, very good common thing about what, what you'd hope to see in said personal statement. Anything oh yeah, sure, sure. Like to, to pop up. So I, I tend to break this down into the three types of applications that we get. There's the first type is um, people that say, I love engineering and then don't really say much more. Yeah. There's then the next level up, which is slightly better, which is I love engineering and I read a book about it once. That's, you know, that's a mild improvement. The, the best application would be the I'm passionate about engineering and here is some tangible evidence that shows that I've done something about it. So I went and took, uh, you know, a 
a voluntary you know internship or possibly even paid if you can get it uh, I joined uh, extracurricular activities I actually did some sort of design or coding work myself and things that you can really talk about say not only do I like engineering I was actually willing to do something about it to, to show you how much I like engineering <laughs> Brilliant. And Thank you. And as someone that reads 3000 drafts, personal statements every year, I can only say, please listen to the advice Joe has just given you. That is gold, very valuable and will save us all a lot of time going forward. <laughs> so that's fantastic. Um, I know there are a few things about just technical things about what you will get at the end of it, whether it's a BSc, MSc. I think all of that information will be on the relevant web pages for, for both of these courses. Uh, we've got, I know Siobhan is around perhaps at the end if someone wants to stay for Bath, so she can ask a few things and, and, and I'll have the Dundee stuff up on the screen as well. Uh, but yeah, most of that stuff is, will be on the basic course information of the site. So we're probably just, just because we're coming to the end now, uh, we'll move on. I think this is something we've probably ended up asking most people in the end, but I, I think really for this topic, perhaps more than any really, because where it's about design, it really is about going forward and what you think the future holds for your graduates and what kind of industries are going to be developed and what are the areas for you know greater improvement in product design you think and um, Chris would you like to answer that one first yeah I think a, a lot of um, our students are, are more aware of societal challenges so things like you know the, the UN sustainab uh, sustainability goals uh, is, is and projects related related to societal challenges are, are more you know are, are coming uh, especially when students reach their fourth year where they have the opportunity to use um, the final year to shape their career paths um, uh, so, so things like sustainability comes in, uh, healthcare uh, uh, projects or healthcare related projects come in increasingly into uh, the forefront. Um, also things like connected objects or internet of things, um, how can, um, you know, uh, things like, uh, you know, beyond your Alexa and your Echo <laughs> products, um, um, you know, these are increasingly being explored as well. Um, yeah, fantastic. And Joe, anything, any new areas for you that you're seeing? Uh, so I would definitely echo what, what Chris has said about the you know UN Sustainable Development Goals. If you'd come into the department 20 years ago, you would have seen nothing but oil and metal. Um, that is changing hugely now. It's uh, an awful lot to do with improving the quality of people's lives and renewable energy and sustainable transport. Um, in addition to that, I think responding to the, the fact that things are more integrated now, uh, it's very rare that you see a purely mechanical system or a purely electronic system. There's usually some elements of, of both and software is an incredible role. But a big one for me is the role of data within design. You know, we are swimming in an ocean of data and used the right way. That can be an incredibly powerful design enabler. Um, it can also be misused horribly, but I would say the role of data within engineering and design is a, a really hot topic at the moment. Absolutely brilliant. Okay, well, I think we'll bring things to a close there on that really kind of fascinating note there about future development. Um, again, all of this information in terms of contact details will be made available to you all. I think um, Siobhan, if you, if you could hear me, if, if you want to just stay on the line, if, if anyone as they're leaving wants to stay and just ask any you know, entry requirement type stuff. Yeah, course, um, maybe we can just dust those off there. So anyone for Bath particularly, and I'll, I'll cover Dundee. I've, I've got their page up, Chris. So don't worry about that. I'll be, I'll be, I'll be very <laughs> accurate for you on your behalf. Um, but if, if you two gentlemen want to leave us now, thank you very much for your time. We really appreciate it. And um, yeah, we are welcome back anytime. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot. And um, for everyone else, yeah, by all means, do leave the, um, the, the, the call now if, you, if you'd like to. And if you do have any particular questions just about entry requirements, that kind of thing, um, or just the structure of the course, then Siobhan will be there to answer those for Bath, and I will do my best to answer something.